Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very great pleasure to be here, and normally I talk significantly off the cuff. However, um, a couple of months ago, I was given a clue which led this talk today to be of very much greater importance than I had ever dreamt. I've been working on tuning unequal temperament for 10 years, but I was given a clue, as I will explain in a little while, um, that totally changes our perception and our perspective. And as a result, this talk and this paper, uh, which I'm presenting to you, um, uh, I won't read it entirely, normally I do talk off the cuff, um, is so important that it became necessary actually to turn it into an academic paper, which I hope will make changes. During the course of my researches, I found that people have been questioning tuning uh, for, as the status quo, for the last 80 years. And to date, nothing has resulted. That must change because people now regard music as an entertainment. How fast can they play? How Loudly, can they play it so fastly? And is it accurate? Oh, oh, clap, 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 it's a circus act. Now, as a result of that, people don't see the imperative of preserving music, teaching music. And budgets for music of local councils are cut. And you go out into the street and find out how many young people are playing the piano or learning the flute or learning the French horn, and it is pathetically low. We're losing our musicians, that Mozart players won't exist in 30 years' time if the current level of teaching continues to decline. We have to do something about it. How do we do something about it? We have to bring back, not the circus act, but the meaning. And the music has incredible meaning, which I hope I will be able to introduce to you today, and if we change our tuning, we can restore that meaning. If we don't, the piano certainly will die a death, as has the cinema organ and the Hammond organ, which has even died a death in crematoria. And so, um, uh, um, in this paper, we're going to be looking at authenticity, the need for it, and the meanings of which we're oblivious on account of the musical equivalent of expecting Google Translate to give us a translation into English from German, having set the translator to read Chinese. Um, by the way, how many of you like curry? Oh, that's encouraging. And how many of you like mangoes? Well, what would you say were it to be made illegal to grow chilies? turmeric or <laughs> and would you really prefer a diet of bananas and yogurt rather than the occasional mango and this is the situation that we find in music because our chili and our turmeric has been made illegal by the commercial interests actually of piano manufacturers and whether it be ignorance or preservation of the status quo you can explain to your Lord Bill in the Fleece, um, to the owner of an £80,000 Steinway, how changing the tuning just slightly, oh, makes the instrument wonderful and enables it to access, but, but oh no, oh, it's cost us 80,000 quid or whatever. Oh no, oh, they know best, they're the experts. Well, they're not, they're technicians. And we've been at the mercy of technicians tuning our pianos for the last 150 years, rather than musicians who tuned their instruments themselves. As musicians as well as non-musicians, we might be unaware that there are problems with the musical scale, known for over 2,000 years, but assumed settled by the assumption of superiority of modern knowledge and swept under the carpet accordingly. We're going to hear those problems here at first hand. There was a legend that music conveyed different emotions granted by the use of particular keys. 
Einstein, who wrote about Spitz in 1941, was not the first to notice that Mozart's specialised use of keys, and likewise Beethoven, Schubert, Chopin and Liszt, were all careful in their choice of key to match different moods. We're going to examine that legend and experience for ourselves how the 18th and 19th century solutions to the scale problem gave rise to those experiences only to be swept away in the 20th century. We're then going to envisit the infamous context of two, Mozart's, two of Mozart's more unusual compositions and find how, without having done so, without understanding the context, the limitations of the original instrument for which it composed and its tuning, which we will find Mozart deliberately exploited, Modern performance, however grand, falls short and fails to convey the meanings intended and celebrated in the time of Mozart. We're then going to ex examine works by Bach, presenting them in a manner unthinkable for 150 years. My training as a physicist is find the assumption. My wife's training as an art historian was find the definition. So between us, uh, we're here today. Um, my wife in spirit rather than in, in physicality. Um, and it leads to different playing and pedaling techniques from Beethoven to Chopin. We're going to examine the piano sonatas by Haydn and Mozart in the tuning known to be used in the 18th century and find surprising revelations, capable of bringing rebirth of interest in both music and religion in the 21st century, even their survival in the light of possible collapse. In order to be a good historian, we have to be a forensic detective, we have to go to the place, to the time, the context, and take witness statements. And the music itself is one of those witness, witnesses. But the witness statements of the music in our time have more been usually dubbed as by Hollywood into a different language, or at least the voices of the protagonists replaced as, as, if, as of concealment of their identity. An actor, as of temperament, has been employed to dub the voice and replace that which was heard at the time was seen in the moving picture. It was an age when rationality wanted to explore reason, the clockwork behind the creator, fascination with the mechanical clocks, automata, and the mechanical duck. Descartes had suggested that the human body could be considered as a machine, and Jonathan Swift, in his mechanical operation of the spirit, had considered the relationship between man as a machine and therefore that a mechanical counterfeit could be made of him. The mechanic Jacques de Vaucanson in 1738 made a mechanical duck that could flap its wings, dabble its beak in water, ingest grains of corn and digest them and excrete the remains. A second similar machine imitated indigestion and flatulence. But it was fake. The poo excreted was not the result of meat and corn ingested and chemically digested, but was a specially prepared concoction, rather, rather as today our tuning has turned the delights of music into what can be misused as Muzak. Haydn is particularly unappreciated, it's just a little another ditty. And as performances focus on the speed, the volume at speed, and whether accurate to the score as a circus act, and entertainment rather than the communication of the deepest emotion. That's why today I brought you to perhaps the Basilica of San Maxima in spirit to hear the devotion of the premier Kiri for the Mass by Couperin. In many ways, as we shall hear, the past 150 years of music has delivered us a false duck. The nature of past times was one of greater feeling of proximity to one's fate, circumstances over which we had no control. Antibiotics weren't then the panacea which took us away from the steps towards death, which today we take for granted. Women died unpredictably in childbirth. Simple infections removed our loved ones and our only hope was in prayer, faith and acceptance of our fate. Our popular composers, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, wrote in a language which spoke to us, in an accent originally as strange to us as Greek or even hieroglyphics. Through the lens of modern interpretation, that soundscape which was descriptive of our human condition has been sterilised. <coughs> 
as to antibiotics by the vibrations of our music through the tuning of our modern experience. So I'm going to demonstrate to you next the reason why there is a problem with tuning and a problem with the musical scale. I'm going to make some hideous noises for which I apologise. Um, and um, in order to hear what are known as the beats, I ask you to tolerate it. So, I'm going to start. Let's see what we've got here. Um, I want 256. Okay, this one will do. That's around middle C, and I'm going to tune an E, um, which which oscillator I'm going to go to 25. Um. Now, can you hear those beating? That's because it's out of tune. What I was listening for then is that you heard those beats getting faster and faster and faster, and eventually those beats get to be a note, and at some stage that note becomes exact. So that was what I was listening for there. Let's now see if these three thirds, because after all, uh, three major thirds. thirds make an octave, don't they? We all know that. Let's see if the first note and the last note match up. Um, and I fear they're not going to, they're going to too much. Oh, ah, there we are. That's our problem with the octave. It doesn't work. Those three major thirds don't make an octave. for 2,000 years, and it doesn't work, it doesn't match up. Now, I talked about that beat note, we're going to hear it next.
Now, you should now be able to hear that bottom note. When we stretch this third, as we do with modern tuning, that note becomes out of tune. Can you hear that's really discordant? With Can you actually hear that resultant note? And that's why... That's why modern tuning is out of tune. And this is why in the 1850s, when the modern tuning started to be used on organs, people said, it's horrible and the music has ceased to be sweet. And so we have been stuck with this unsweet tuning that produces these horrible notes. And um, as a French horn player and as brass players, we're used to these notes, um, these series of notes, because air pipes or strings have to vibrate in <coughs> exact numbers of times, whether it be once, I have here a very special instrument, and this is very rare. It's a monochord. And it's with a monochord with measurements, gradations from 0 to 1,200 that theoreticians have examined the scale since the days of Pythagoras. And I'm going to demonstrate harmonics. So that there is one note. But within that one note, There's the octave above, because it's vibrating twice. Um, here, that's vibrating three times. Four, do you hear it up there? And then, so that's four, and here, Now, our notes of the scale should, if they're going to be harmonious and produce harmonious music, they should produce those notes exactly. And when they don't, it doesn't resonate. And the modern tuning puts the notes out of tune. And as a result, the modern music does not resonate. Now, string players, horn players, we all work together in quartets and whatever, and we're using perfect intervals. There's a note below that. So that is the number of times the pipe vibrating in different uh, places. Now, as horn players, we have to adjust our semitone so that... Is the same as so you can hear there that one note isn't spot on as the keyboard we can alter it by using a different pressure on our lips and by using different fingering com combinations in order to, for our harmony to fit with all the other instruments. And so this is the importance of that tuning, and this is why orchestral music tends to sound more harmonious. But the piano and the organ have been lost. Musicians, um, so um, we're going to come now to the effect of that. Because if we change our scales so that some of the keys have those notes on the harmonics, then other of those keys will have quite a lot of notes quite far removed from the harmonics. This means that each key then has a different character. And in 1787, and that's particularly important because we're looking now specifically at the time of Mozart, uh, Christian Schubert, who Dr. Charles Burney re referred to as being the most amazing harpsichordist, wrote a list of the emotional effects that musical keys could be expected to create 
in anyone listening to music composed and performed in that key. And in your notes, um, I've actually given a list of uh, Schubert's emotions and, and keys. The ideas are coloured, pun is intended, or rather clouded by confusion with the meaning of colour as applied to music. This is not a colour that you can see, although for many with synesthesia, musical tones do induce concepts of visible, visible colour. But instead, instead, it's a reference to a spectrum of vibrations, just as you see a spectrum of colours in the rainbow in the sky. It was Isaac Newton himself who identified the octave and its steps of tones with the near octaves of the vibrations of visible light between red through the spectrum to violet, or more correctly, from infrared to ultraviolet. Thus, the chromatic scale is nothing to do with merely the going up of scale as the scale in half steps. Chromatic. And I'm very pleased to see a lot of people with white hair here who have used cameras using film made by Kodak called Koda. Chrome. Chrome! Colour! Where's the colour in our modern music? And so... Um, the chromatic scale is nothing to do with merely the going up of the scale in half steps. Read the Wikipedia entry on chromatic scales and you'll see that modern music totally misses the mark and misses the point. It's about the emotions and the vibrations of the music as we perceived it. Whilst perhaps in knowledge of our first steps at the keyboard, we might all agree C major to be completely pure. We'll agree with Schubert that its character is Innocence, simplicity, naivety, children's talk. Going to the minor, C minor, we can persuade ourselves of a declaration of love and at the same time the lament of unhappy love. All languishing, longing, sighing of the lovesick soul. But then we start to see the key explanations become more exotic. D major, the key of triumph, of hallelujahs, of war cries, of victory rejoicing. Thus, the inviting symphonies, the marches, holiday songs, and heaven-rejoicing choruses are set in this key. Well, perhaps. Then E-flat major, the key of love, of devotion, of intimate conversation with God. But is it really different from D major? Well, try it on a normal piano, and I haven't heard the difference. After all, we can shift the keyboard of a transposing harpsichord and play D major up a note. Does it really sound different? Have you ever said, heard it really sound different? And it's this, of course, that means that when people whittle on about, oh, he did that in C minor, you know, he only composed sad things in C minor. You know, the man in the streets just thinks, God, these are highbrow things. Oh, this is just for, the, the, just for the elite. They're not interested in music as a result. We have to bring music properly to our ears. Perhaps what follows might sound, sound like the reading of a psychic. D sharp minor. We're going to play something in E flat minor later on. Feelings of the anxiety of the soul's deepest distress, of brooding despair, of blackest depression, of the most gloomy condition of the soul. Every fear, every hesitation of the shuddering heart breathes out the horrible D sharp minor. If ghosts could speak, their speech would approximate this key. Have we really ever heard such a thing? Reverting to F major. Complacence and calm. Yes, of course, we'll read on, but what sound comes next sounds more like an astrological chart. F minor, deep depression, funereal lament, groans of misery, and logging for the grave. Certainly, by the time we get to A flat major, the text looks increasing like a tarot card reading. Key of the grave, death, grave, putrefaction, judgment, it. Eternity lie in its radius. Upon reaching B major, however, strongly we'd like to believe, strongly coloured, announcing wild passions composed from the most glaring colours. Anger, rage, jealousy, fury, despair, and every burden of the heart lies in this sphere. Rationality demands pigeonholing Schubert into the realm of a highly stretched imagination. It's the incomprehensibility of such descriptions that cause many untrained in music to dismiss classical music to the realm of the elite, that you have to be educated to hear it, for it to mean anything, and for it to be dismissed merely as the realm of the highbrow. 
However, what we're about to hear when we restore the colour to the music of the tuning of instruments as used in music's time brings emotion that can be heard by all. You might not like it. It's carry. It's time to take the witness statement of the music itself and see what we might be able to hear it say. First, we're going to take a journey in a time machine to a different time and place. We're going to go... Have any of you been to the Tate Modern? Yes. Yes. It's been dismissed as superficial, but we're going to take, go to the equivalent of Tate Modern um, in Vienna in Mozart's time in 1791. Yeah, so we're looking at a contemporary modern art installation, a gallery filled with plaster casts and waxworks. Our host in Vienna is the Count, Count Joseph Dame von Streititz, but ever since an elaborate attempt, uh, sorry, ever since he killed an adversary in a duel, he's returned to the city as Joseph Muller. Central to the exhibition is an elaborate temple surmounted by a clock. Its pendulum is luminous and swings hypnotically. Before us, we see a glass coffin in which we see the hero of the Battle of Belgrade, Field Marshal Lardon laid out in state, were invited to reflect upon his daring do, his life, joy, and tragic curtailment of his sudden demise, to stand to attention and honour befitting this marching man, and mourn as with the kneeling figure of a Turkish lady at his feet. The scenes, the very description of deep depression, funereal lament, groans of misery and longing for the grave. Upon the, hour of the upon the hour, the clock plays some music, regularly, without stopping. Life marches on to that inevitability of death, which comes to us all. Time is all. And the music that accompanies it is composed by the master. Mozart's Fantasia for Organ, no, Mechanical clock! In guess which key? If we ask Schubert which key Mozart should have used, he drove her straight to F minor. Later, let's, sorry, let's hear it as we normally experience the opening of the Fantasia in F minor, K608, on a large organ in a large acoustic in a modern tuning. There are many technicalities in synthesising um, the difference between how we hear now and how it was heard originally. So, you'll be familiar with this. have experienced when visiting Laudon's grave in his glass coffin, coffin, surrounded by mirrors, making you 
reflect upon the scene. That's how we lose Mozart. With various performers over the last past decade for whom I have the greatest of gratitude and we have today two star wonders who have tolerated my obsession with tuning. And thank you to both of you and to coming today and for your enthusiasm and encouragement over the past decade. Um, because I owe it to you both and to many other performers who have performed at Hammerwood Park over the past decade to achieve what we're experiencing, I hope, to your pleasure and enlightenment and intrigue today. And I've been working on piano tuning and exploring the sort of tuning that classical co composers expected to be used, of which Bach would have approved and which would work on modern pianos. That is important. This isn't the sort of tuning that we're hearing here for the purposes of the demonstration of this paper. I wasn't expecting to be using the, and I'll say extreme, when I considered it, I used to consider it extreme tuning that we're going to hear today, um, but I'm now rethinking my piano tuning. Um, the acquisition for Hamilton Park of an 18th century barrel organ from the Cult Collection provided the clue. This was in June, so you can see that um, I've been working very, very rapidly over the last past few months to come here today. Um, and Alexandra will tell you um, uh, what the state of this lecture was last Thursday. It's been nice and day since. Um, I knew that that barrel organ would contain information about tuning, and it did by an indirect route. I'd heard that Mozart expected a temperament known as mean tone to have been used, but always considered it too strong, too limiting for the tuning of the piano, because I didn't understand it. We'll address that later. An expert on barrel organs, Arthur Ord Hume, had restored the Hammerwood Park barrel organ for the cult in the 1970s. In his book about repair of such 18th century instruments, he wrote with the modern tuning bias of the 20th century, for which I forgive him. We've all been led up the garden path with this false duck and assumed that it's the real thing. So we'll forgive him for having that equal temperament bias. The system of unequal temperament was followed until at least the middle of the 19th century. And this is, explains why it is difficult to tune some early instruments to the scale as we know it today. Many of the tonal imperfections which are educated ears wince at today were indeed acceptable and intentional at the time the organ was first made. This lecture, this paper, this presentation today owes the whole to Ord Hume for his observations on old organs and writing that. Here was a mechanical organ of 1790 that the year Mozart composed for the mechanical organ for Dame, and we're told that its tuning should make us wince. So let's try it. We're going to try producing the same way that a modern organist would approach the piece on an originally tuned instrument. for a grand organ, but for the mechanical clock upon us, upon which we could reflect with the music upon the grave of 
lard on. Um, so we're going to try it as it was originally conceived on that clock. Um, and so um, I synthesised here the original mechanical organ, knowing, of course, the interiors of bar barrel organs. It would have to have stopped pipes and that halves the length to fit them into a clock. And for the base, it couldn't have big pipes, so it used a reed like a bassoon, but these don't have to have big resonators, they can have just very short resonators, so they can fit into a clock. That's the clue. Now, um, the, um, so we'll hear the opening of the other uh, Fantasia, K594. Um, and it's not too soon to mention Freemasonry here. It opens with, on the one hand, the march of the Major General, but uh, in the army, the march of time. But normally marches in four time or two time. No, this is in three. Why in three? It's the symbol of perfection, of divinity, of trinity, the three pillars that hold up the temple. The notes of the first bar are a minor triad, a minor third, a major third, and an inverted major third, and a minor third. The purity of thirds, as we discovered when we were using those oscillators, getting pure thirds, was the feature of mean tone, so that they sound sweet. Stacked thirds were a symbol to Mozart of harmony. Um, hang on, I think that Mozart joined the Masonic Lodge called the, Mos the Lodge of Harmony. I've got to check that. It was either Mo Mozart or Haydn. Um, three steps were required in the Lodge to reach the Orient where the Grand Master is seated. Um, the fourth bar, repeating the three steps of the th former three, feels like reaching above and beyond of before. The five bars of steps of three may be as the five points of fellowship. This is associated with the right of the third degree in Freemasonry, which I discovered by accident upon playing one of the Mozart piano sonatas to a friend. Hiram the Biff has been sent by King Hiram to help build Solomon Temple. Solomon's Temple is symbolic, by the way, that's another subject. Three ruffians demand to know secrets for him, push him about, and upon refusing to give over the secrets, the third ruffian kills him. That fourth bar of what we're about to hear sounds to me a rebellious spirit and imagination can give over to any of the images above, surveying the site of the tomb before us. And a central tenet of Freemasonry is moving from the idea of darkness into light. From the darkness of the first three bars, we move to light in the seventh, seven being an important number. It's also interesting because uh, because of the time, we're not going to hear the whole of 594 today, but I'm going to play 608. Um, but 594 changes from F minor to F major, as in darkness to light. So, um, the, uh, we can, uh, as we, uh, uh, our thoughts, as we produce the grave before us, the, um, the music takes us through all the permutations of upstanding bravery, truncated life, the soul reaching to heaven, and mourning. We don't need to hear the, uh, 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 the, to, with a big effect. Just two ranks of pipes, small enough to fit into the clock, and a tuning to make us wince. So we're going to hear the opening, at least, of K594. Um, if there's time after lunch or whatever, you can hear the whole thing. But let's have a look just at the opening. Um. <laughs>
Could you see General Laudon's grave before you? <laughs> Wasn't it? I know that some of you have said no. Um, um, but um, I think that this performance gives us much more of a um, much more of an emotional experience than does the modern performance on the wrong instrument in the wrong place in the wrong tuning. I'm going to go back to uh, 608 and we'll hear the whole thing. Um, uh, the fugue in the middle is interesting because this is symbolic of the soul flowing to heaven. The fugue was um, a comment upon time and timelessness and eternity. So let's... <laughs> Don't worry. Um, uh, extra sound effects <coughs> have received. Um, so here we go.
what's really interesting is that putting that upon the instrument for which it was originally composed means that, of course, the mechanical clock, I heard somebody talking about musical boxes um, before the lecture today, and he'll know about all sorts of aspects of musical boxes, but the mechanical instrument does things that the human performer can't perform. That's what Mozart was writing for here, and so eyewitness accounts talk about the sound as having been from um, uh, a couple of flutes and a bassoon, and it lasting eight minutes. So there you've heard the eight minute performance. Um, um, in a large cathedral, in the grand style or whatever, uh, modern performers take 11 or 12 minutes over it. No, eight! And didn't the spirit of go, go up to heaven? In the middle, I don't know if you noticed a pastoral scene in which birds were singing. Obviously, you know, camping out in, on marches in the, you know, on the battlefield and whatever. There are all sorts of nuances in that performance, I think, that we might have picked up that we would never, ever have guessed from the conventional performance. And so, as musicians, we've been bamboozled for too long and forgotten the meanings of what we do with a key to unlock to access a different place and the meaning of chromatic, the real meaning concerning matters of colour. Percy Scholes, in 1948, who was a, a frequent writer and contributor to Groves and so on, wrote in his two volumes, The Great Dr. Burney, uh, commenting, it looks as though, in asking the simple question, how did Wesley I think it was Samuel Wesley, play Bach's 48 Preludes and Fugues through a well-tempered clavier in all the keys on Burney's, Dr. Burney's piano, tuned to mean tone temperament. One, challenge, one is challenging the acousticians and scientific musical historians to a little fresh consideration of a subject on which they have so far pronounced rather too dogmatically and without sufficiently checking their statements by an examination of the actual musical repertory of the 18th century. Percy Scholes wrote that in 1948, and here we still are, hearing renowned pianists playing Bach's 48 on an equal-tempered modern piano. We're hearing <coughs> such pianists famous for playing Haydn, playing his variations in F minor, the key of the grave, on an equal-tempered piano. And they don't sound anything at all. And for goodness sake, this is nearly 70 years later, and we haven't made any progress. That's why I'm here today. That's why I have presented this as a paper, which I hope will carry appropriate academic authority. So I'm introducing you now to Alexandra Kamakova to help us with some Bach and challenging the assumptions of music in our time. She's going to play for us very deliberately examples of theoretically the wrong stuff in the wrong keys. Keys in which conventional wisdom would tell us that Bach's well-tempered clavier simply could not be played. I will explain actually why we can play it as a matter of harmonics, as I discovered earlier. Um, and so we need to put that through there. Um, she'll set the scene in C major, which of course is the key of completely pure its character, innocence, simplicity, naivety, children's talk, and then progress. Perhaps you'll take a, you might take a view where the Bach's composition took into account the delicacy of the keys in which he was writing, delicately played, and whether those keys would have been described by Schubert in terms which anyone could really hear for themselves. She'll move between Bach's original conceived instrument, the clavichord, to organ specifically registered for the mood conceived for Bach's choice of key. Before she comes to help us, I'm going to explain to you technically, which is how, having heard harmonics and these tones, you might be able to hear it technically why mean tone works 
and why um, in the nasty keys, where you have horrible tuned thirds, which make us wince, the sweet overcomes the sour. You all know that eating mango after curry overcomes the chilli. So when I play... vibrate on the odd harmonics and as a result this stop enables you to play in mean tone with sensitivity and I'm going to go up the chromatic scale and the next note is so far out it hardly conflicts so that's meant to be nasty if I put it on the normal diapason all the harmonics but when I cut out the uh, 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 other harmonics it's still sweet so the sweetness depends upon what instrument we're playing it on how sensitively we're playing it if we play it on the normal hard sounds with all the harmonics yes of course it's foul all of these emotions and provided it's played sensitively it's sweet if we play it wrongly oh dear we have the impression that modern musicians have had about mean tone so alexandra please can i beg you to come and show us how bar sounds in mean tone no one ever dreamt it hi so it's going to very briefly um I'm going to play a couple of bars of the C major prelude and then I'm going to play a couple of bars. Instead of playing in the C major, I'm going to play in C sharp. So just so we can see the very big difference in this particular tuning. Um, just a little note, Bach himself was uh, um, not using mean tone when he composed these pieces. So he, um, he called it well-tempered because he, he tweaked it a little bit so it would sound a bit more pleasurable. However, he was coming from a historical perspective where this would be the norm and a lot of the instruments in Germany at the time would have been tuned to mean tones. So this is sort of the background he was coming from. So just a couple of bars first to, to compare and then I'm going to go into the quad chords. Right. And what we'll do, because the first is C major, we can play C major um, in quite a lively sort of sound. So let's give it quite a lively sort of sound. Yeah, no, not quite as well. That's it, that's fine. No, 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 it's, it's, it's at the back of it. He did compose a 
big amount of pieces which are all in different characters and one would wonder why they're so how did he come across so many characters and wrote those pieces in different keys and why did he choose a particular piece with a particular character in a particular key and actually interestingly enough we found out with David that um, the keys I mean there's been quite a lot of research about it as well but uh, the keys more often than not correspond with the traditional um, sort of expectations at his time in the Baroque era of what each key means. So certain keys are considered to be more happy and positive, certain keys are more on the depressing side, um, sort of sad and var the various sort of the multitude of those emotions, so they're quite complex. So I think I'm going to go on to F do we do we break it at quarter to one? No, no. We, finish we, we finish at twelve fifteen. Yeah. Okay, so we're into doing extracts rather than yeah. full items. Okay, so so whenever, uh, we're doing uh, uh, E flat minor. Right. E flat minor. Um, e flat minor, feelings of the anxiety of the soul's deepest distress, a brooding despair, a blackest depression of the most gloomy condition of the soul. <laughs> are surmounted. Echo of a soul which was fiercely struggled and finally conquered lies in all uses of this key. This key is everything struggling with difficulty. Compared to the previous one, this is very easy. It's a three voice prelude, very, um, very polyphonic, and there's sort of voices struggling to come through all the time. So it does come across as quite laborious, which I'll try to demonstrate in a short span of time. <coughs> of this music that you find real depths of emotional change. I'm just with Alexandra demonstrating the worst ones to prove that our prejudice against mean tone and against and our assumptions about the well-tempered clavier might need adjusting. We're going to play A flat major, key of the grave. Death, grave, putrefaction. Judgment, eternity, 
When did you ever hear that in any music at all? So I hope we might hear it now. <laughs> in which he, um, he uh, uh, documented all keys, um, well, all the major keys. Um, oh, are we going to do this on organ or...? It's often, it's in actual fact, it is often, um, it's often specified for organ, so let's hear it on organ. Um, um, now, hang on, I've got to find my... Uh, we're going to present it as facade, um, if I can find my cheat notes. Right, um, you're going to have to shout at me when the next key comes. Okay. C major. C major. Completely pure. Thank you. 
moment, eternity. He stresses that chord. Play it again. A note, no doubt, A flat major. Oh. And so. Sonatas, the piano sonatas um, of Mozart, which I have found absolutely astounding. I found him entering um, different emotions, um, imitating the sound of crying, expressing a broken heart followed by recovery and then anger. We all know Mozart had a sense of humour. Yes, he used it in a sense of humour, as banana skins to slip on and then recover in the next bar or so, as if nothing had happened, and in entering a dark tunnel to re-emerge into the light. His early six sonatas are surprising because they predate Mozart's entry into Freemasonry by around ten years, but um, number K280 of which we've prepared XX today, but there aren't time. Perhaps this might actually uh, work as a seminar where we might engage perhaps John Young to perform a number of the piano sonatas because they are astounding. It is actually a, uh, a, um, a, a description of the rite of the third degree ceremony of Freemasonry in which one is buried in the grave <laughs> And having died, one comes to life again in the mind, having known death. This was central to rebirth. This was central not just to Freemasonry, but to the Moravians in a way, also to Catholicism. Mozart was a devout Catholic as well as a Freemason. Um, and so we've got a vast amount of musical and expressive material in the, um, in the uh, piano sonatas. Um, K280 um, is absolutely wonderful. Um, K3322 is wonderful. Um, Haydn was at it also, and I'd like Jean Young, although because of time is pressing, etc., we're just worried about time, but perhaps you might play just the first two lines of the Haydn, just so you can hear Haydn. Um, Haydn is constantly shifting as in a pendulum from darkness into light, and this is very, very Masonic. Um, but Sonata K547 was published together with the Fantasia K475, and K4, K475 Fantasia um, is uh, composed in the year of in Mozart's entry into Freemasonry, and it's with this that we will close the presentation today, and it is just transcendental. Thank you very, very much indeed. John Young, thank you so much. I'm sure everybody knows Haydn um, was uh, very well known when Mozart was a child, and they really um, great <laughs> admired each other, completely different style. Um, you can hear that um, Haydn always admired Mozart's soul. Um, and it was these two pieces are actually composed in a similar time frame. So it's be quite interesting to hear what a difference sort of music. But he's doing a Masonic thing. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe 
this is a grand piano, you know, in the large hall. This is Haydn, E minor.
and how we wish you all your best.